Martha comes from Oberlin College, now in the Cambridge area, grew up in Iowa as an only child, spent a lot of time outdoors using her imagination, also enjoyed playing with friends, especially in the woods. And she grew up loving to read and remembers especially uh, loving having her mother read to her, an important thing, all you young mothers out there. She wrote a few poems in childhood, but most came in her early 30s. Martha believes uh, living in a racially mixed, diverse community helped to fuel her poetry, as well as thinking on social issues. She now has five collections of her poetry, most recently white papers. She has traveled to Vietnam and has translated Vietnamese poetry. She has two books of co-translated Vietnamese poetry. And her book length poem, Blue Front won an Ansfield Wolf Award and also was chosen as one of 25 books to remember from 2006 by the New York Public Library. She's received a number of fellowships from the NEA, the Bunting Institute and more, three pushcart prizes. And she has shared her poetry at readings throughout the country. It's been aired on NPR. Martha has also been busy teaching. She founded the Creative Writing Program for UMass in Boston and served as professor of creative writing for Oberlin for 10 years. She's currently an editor at Large for Field Magazine and one of the editors for Oberlin College Press. And she also teaches at the annual Joiner Center for Creative Writing summer workshops intended for veterans of war, also open to the public. And it will be taking place in a few weeks in Boston. As a great deal of her work is published, and Martha also works in the publishing world, I asked her her thoughts about why poetry should be shared with others. And she said, poetry began as an oral art before we had writing, we had poems. Writing and then printing made it possible and desirable to share it, written ways as well. But the oral aspect of poetry won't go away. With the internet, we no longer need poetic form to help us remember things. And I love this part especially. But the pleasure of making music with words and listening to that music is a deep one. And now to share some music and some poetry with us, with her words of poems. Uh, please help me give a warm welcome to Martha Collins. I'm just going to be reading from my very new book, so new that I've been calling it a baby book. I think it may be a toddler now. It just came out this spring. It's called, as Cheryl mentioned, White Papers. It's a book that follows on the heels of the book-length poem Cheryl also mentioned um, that focuses on a lynching that my father witnessed when he was a kid. The primary victim of that lynching was an African-American man. And while I was writing the book, for the most part, I was thinking about how this would have affected my five-year-old father to see a lynching. But the more I wrote, the more I began to think about what this all had to do with me, a white woman living 100 years later. And then the term white papers came into my mind, inviting me to explore questions of race, particularly of whiteness, from a variety of perspectives. On the one hand, a lot of these poems go back to my childhood. I haven't written a great deal about that before. It was a very white childhood in Iowa. But here, as in writing about the lynching, I've also done a certain amount of research, specifically about places where I've lived, which of course include New England as well as Iowa. The poems are untitled um, and in a sense, all connected to each other. They have numbers that I won't read. I will just kind of pause briefly between them, sometimes with comments and sometimes without. So I'll start in the beginning with Iowa. Because my father said yes, but not in our lifetimes. Because my mother said, I know my daughter would never want to marry but mostly because they rarely spoke of or noticed or even whispered about and did not, of course, 
because magazines rarely, TV rarely, textbooks rarely or not at all, except for <coughs> figures like George Washington Carver, who'd lived in our state. Because among the crayons, there was one called flesh. Because paintings rarely or never until. Because books from the library never until. Because college literature not at all. The American Lit Anthology had only Gwendolyn Brooks, who was not a sign. Because a few years after Brown v. Board of Education, I wrote a paper that took the position, yes, but not yet. This next poem begins in Iowa. Uh, I grew up in Des Moines, uh, which like much of the Midwest is very much on a grid, so that if you looked at a map of the city in the phone book, which you could do every year, you would see a series of squares. The poem uh, subsequently goes to Africa, which of course is the place where all of our human ancestors began. They lived in the colored section of town, as if the white pages map had been crayoned, little squares inside the lines, as if they too had been covered with color, something added to what was given, i.e. ourselves, who did not know, not even our teachers, that they were the given, that we were the altered, that we, who still were they, there was no difference yet, lost our color, slowly erased it as we moved north where a distant sun could not get through. And on we went, making roads and maps of rivers and roads, assuming we owned it if we could draw it and color it in and give it a name. And still we are drawing lines and calling them borders and coloring in and naming people who shall not, must not cross, who live in the colored sections of our white minds. The next two focus on slavery in New England. Um, the first begins, uh, I'm driving through a town, I suppose, a little <coughs> like this one. White line, broken line, white dividing right from white, white sign, house, oh, New England, white church, white meeting house on green commons, where slaves could not stroll at night in Boston, carry sticks or canes, where African slaves were first bought with Pequots captured in just war, where slaves were sometimes sold in taverns, where churches bought them for ministers, where ministers, lawyers, doctors, farmers used them for cutting, carting, hoeing, husking, mowing, ferrying, carrying, and where, in any case, the slave trade. Where the last slave died in 1859 in Rhode Island, Oh, New England, your white meeting, broken, oh. This is my piano poem. There's a line at the beginning that comes from Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, um, which never occurred to me had anything to do with me until I started reading for this book. Black keys from trees, white keys locked on black shoulders, locked together above skeleton ribs, keys to 45 keyboards from one tusk. The word ivory rang through the air, one tusk plus one slave to carry it, bought together. If slaves survived the long march, sold for spice or sugar plantations, if not, replaced by other slaves. Five Africans died for each tusk, 
two million for 400,000 American pianos, including the one my grandmother played, not to mention grieving villages burned, women, children left to die, the dead elephants whose tusks went to Connecticut, where they were cut, bleached, and polished. While my grandmother played in Illinois, my mother played and I. There were many old pianos, and slaves were used till the 20th century. An African slave could have carried a tusk that was cut into white keys I played, starting with middle C and going up and down. And then, when they couldn't afford it, but they did afford it, they hired Cecil to wash iron clean once a week. My mother picked her up and took her back to the colored section of town. And once she had my mother to lunch with her friends. And sometimes they prayed together, including the day before my wedding, for which she served the reception, although she also came to the service. We all loved her, loved her wisdom. I loved her beautiful crown of braids. Who knows what she felt? What did I know about her? Ask her first name. Of course, there were browns who weren't black but we called them white or didn't call them or know them, except for Senor Briseño, who taught Spanish. No one was Latin American then or Hispanic or Latino, although we'd heard a name for Mexicans and also one for Italians who lived in their own section of town. Of course, there were the confusing other Indians, one of whom my mother knew, a pastor's wife who wore a sari so people wouldn't think she was, you know, what she wasn't. My mother had a Lebanese friend who went to our church, but no one was Arab or Muslim then, or terrorist, only communist. Our other did not live among us, except, of course, for African Americans who were still called Negro or colored, who were not many in our city, but were just enough to be other than whatever it was we were. Um, current events also get referred to here. I was writing this book in 2008, which, like this year, of course, was an election year. Um, so that gets into the next poem, which begins, however, with another contemporary reference to the unlikely source of a passion magazine. I don't read these often, but I was reading one in the gym and came upon a little headline that introduced some spring colors, which is how the poem begins with that quote. Stark white and colonial khaki rule the urban jungle. The British brought khaki to India, dyed their summer whites. The American army copied in 1898 our first colonial war. And afterward, until we went to the jungle and copied trees. There is no jungle in this our first largely urban war. In this war, our letter stamps became flags waving on khaki. Why don't you wear a flag pin? They asked one of our candidates, who often wears white shirts, which look quite nice against his khaki American skin. (laughs) 
this next one has um, a good deal of history in it. The missing word, as I think you'll recognize early on, is white, um, which only appears at the end. The Irish were not, the Germans were not, the Jews, Italians, Slavs, and others were not, or were not exactly, or not quite, at various times in American history. Before us, the Greeks themselves were not, though the weaker enemy Persians were. The next up Romans themselves were not either. And later, the Europeans were not until Linnaeus named by color red, white, yellow, and black. Even the English settlers were only vaguely at first to contrast with natives. But then with Africans, more and more of them slaves to be irreversibly totally different from they were. Then others were not, then were or were not but gradually became, leaving only for a time black and yellow to be not. Then there were other words for those who were still or newly, see immigrant, Arab, somehow not the same and therefore not. Thus history leaves us nothing but not like children playing at being something. We made, we keep making our whiteness up. <laughs> no Chinatown in my hometown, just missionary chopstick news. We knew that San Francisco had, we didn't know the gold rush brought them maybe knew the transcontinental railroad brought. We didn't know when it was done. The act of 1882 excluded the women still were bought to, yes, until the war. We knew when it wasn't China, it was Japan. This was years before I rode the train to a school near San Francisco built by one of the rich railroad men, my large class had a few Asian Americans. I knew one. This next poem is in fragments that sort of run into each other. It's about white privilege. Could get a credit card, loan car, come and go without a never had to think about a school, work, job, to open doors, to buy a rent a nice place, yard, park, beside a walk in any store without a never had to dress, to buy a dress, shoes, underwear, to understate or play myself, to make myself heard, to get across a street, a never mind point. I never had to earn the right to make my way if I should lose my way or all I own. My open door world was all before me where to choose to and I. This next one has a few exclamation points in it, um, which I never use. But these are kind of pseudo tabloid headlines, uh, not real ones because some of this material is from the 19th century, including the theory that um, some people devised that there was a second creation of human beings after Noah's flood since white people and black people couldn't possibly have been created at the same time. There's also a reference in this poem to vitiligo, which is the skin condition where pigmentation is lost in patches, which apparently Michael Jackson suffered from. Black people can turn white, see vitiligo. Black people can be white, see albino. White people can turn black, see miscegenation laws against. <laughs> 
So they measured brain space, lined up skulls, invented a second creation for after the flood. So they measured test scores, not the test, told us that we must reproduce, told them to go back home. Because black people could brown people, could brown people, could yellow people, could brown people, could white people, could disappear. Because people could. Two more. My white, I've said, my baby bed, underwear, tub, toilet, washing machine, whatever got rid of dirt, my wedding dress, veil, whatever could hide X sheets bleached, coffin lined against the dark dirt band. When we started to buy underwear in colors, even black, white was on its way out of cover over. <laughs> and the last poem. <clears throat> although my father, although my mother, although we rarely, although we whispered, although the silence, although the absence, although even now some TV books, not to mention radio websites, new militias, hate groups raging against our socialist, communist, fascist, although, but still, our textbooks now, our museums mostly, our college literature courses, even our crayons, not to mention our young president who could scarcely have been imagined when we, when I. And although I've gone back and filled in some blanks, I'm still learning this unlearning, untying the knot of yes but, rewriting this Yes. Yes. Thank you. The blueprints lay for 50 years, unseen but not forgot, rolled up tight and waiting for a chance they would be sought to share with a growing grandson ways with wood and love of sea and the value of working hard and continuity the rowboat came to life as planks were sawn along the grain curls of wood fell to the floor shavings from the plane each shiny coat a varnish brushed one layer at a time the boat he and his grandpa built so sturdy and so fine we'd row her through the salt marsh when tide was out air was still winds picked up red sail was raised cape cod bay we'd hail until it was time to come about set sail on starboard reach slow her down let the wind spill out make way for kingsbury beach the rowboat came to life as planks were sawn along the grain curls of wood fell to the floor shavings from the plane each shiny coat a varnish brushed one layer at a time the boat he and his grandpa built so sturdy and so fine ease on down the mast now grab the oars coil the lines head on down a sandy path that winds beneath scrub pines that leads us to the cottage tired hungry but quite pleased eat lobster 
play gin rummy and some catch between the trees. The boat has many memories tucked inside her hold. Some will be remembered, many more yet to unfold. A link from past to present to a future now unknown. Someday for him to pass along to grandsons of his own. boat came to life as planks were sawn along the grain. Curls of wood fell to the floor, shavings from the plain. Each shiny coat a varnish brushed one layer at a time. The boat he and his grandpa built, so sturdy and so fine. The boat he and his grandpa built, so sturdy and so fine. Thank you. The name of this is Taking It In. Sitting quietly, attentive to life, watching, listening, taking it in. The sky, air so blue, the trees, gentle rustling watching, listening, taking it in. Moment to moment, life in the present. Watching, listening, taking it in. Thank you. <laughs>